None of that would have been possible if I'd listened to that idiot YouTuber who told me not to buy a drone. When it comes down to you deciding if you want to buy a drone, know that you probably can't fly it wherever you th you're thinking of flying. That guy almost ruined my life. I'm so glad I didn't listen to him. You see, a year and a half ago, I did something so unthinkable, so hurtful, I suggested maybe some people shouldn't spend their money on a gadget. We're gonna talk about that video as well as everything that's changed that might make you wanna buy a drone right now. But first, I wanna thank our sponsor, KEH, who makes this possible. KEH has the biggest inventory of used cameras, lenses, and drones like this. They guarantee everything they have. You're not gonna get scammed. You're not gonna get stuck with something that doesn't work. And if you have a used drone, camera lens, or anything like that, send it to KEH and they can buy it from you. I've sold them more than $20,000 worth of gear personally, not related to a sponsorship. I just really like their service. A year and a half ago, I made a video called Don't Buy a Drone, and for some reason, half a million of you decided to watch it, and it seems like most people who watched it already had a drone, and were just gonna be super mad at me as if my video was actually me going to their house and destroying their drones. I made the video because I talked to a lot of real people who had bought a drone and had a terrible experience with it. A lot of them immediately wrecked their drone. A lot of people had paranoid neighbors who thought they were being creepy. People had the police called on them. I've had that happen multiple times. Or you get to places you wanna film and find out you can't actually film there because drones are restricted in so many places. I wanted to make people aware of those concerns because Drone marketing right now is very misleading. Like just watch the ads, and right away you'll notice they don't ever put the drone sounds in. We got a shot that I loved. I was sitting in the back of the cathedral, and I got to have my camera all the way up close. For that first kiss, I could fly it back and see everyone at their wedding who was sharing the moment with me. ridiculous because so much of flying a drone is that loud buzzing sound. One of the things that has changed in the last year and a half is drones have gotten quieter and quieter. Another thing that's changed in the last year and a half is the release of the Mavic 2. That zoom is so incredibly powerful. Finally, you have the ability to change the relationship between the foreground and background. If you can't get close enough to your subject, maybe it's not safe, you can zoom in. And with the release of the Mavic Mini, which we'll have a review on in the next week or so, subscribe to see that, you'll be able to pick one up for about 400 bucks, and it's smaller than the Flash that I would normally carry in my bag. Suddenly, these drones are capable, small, and pretty easy to use, and they are becoming an accessory that really every photographer needs to have in their bag. Those are all good. The tech keeps improving, of course, they become more useful, but the number one thing, at least in the United States, isn't about the technology, but it's about the laws. This past summer, the FAA changed a lot of regulations to open up a world of new opportunities for both professional, but especially enthusiast drone operators. Before, you couldn't fly within five miles of an airport five miles of an airport. And that meant almost all the populated parts of the United States were technically legally unflyable unless you went through a lengthy part 107 certification. That has changed a lot with the wider adoption of Lance. Recognizing the need for a safe and efficient approval process to fly drones in these situations, the FAA developed the low altitude authorization and notification capability, called Lance for short. When I made my previous video, technically Lance existed, but almost no airports actually supported it. Now in November 2019, just about every large to medium-sized airport supports it. The small airstrips like the one near me still don't support it, which means I still can't automatically get approval to fly in their airspace. But whether you're a professional or a consumer, if you can now automatically get approval to fly in their controlled airspace without having to call the tower and try to negotiate, there's actually something bigger. DJI has changed their app. Now, for years, the DJI app has prevented you from flying your drone in any kind of controlled airspace, including in wide circles around the airport. But recently, they've tweaked that so that now you're only restricted from flying near the flight paths. You see that blue line around that airport there? That's the airport closest to my house, and I still can't fly in that blue area, but it used to be a massive radius that prevented me from flying in many of my favorite spots. 
So now I can revisit those spots and actually get some usable aerial footage and I can do so legally. It's opened up huge amounts of the populated United States and I don't know if you'll be able to fly. If you're in New York City, you can't fly. You should still just avoid getting a drone. But if you're traveling out of New York City, it might still be worthwhile. So my suggestion would be to install the DJI GO app even before you get a drone and then browse the areas where you might want to fly and see what the new restrictions are. Because if you had checked it out even just like a year ago, it was very different and much worse. Now, that's in the United States. Other parts of the world might not have gotten better at all. Like Morocco, you still cannot bring a drone into Morocco. I'm not gonna list every country. You're just gonna have to do your own research for where you live, but it's worth looking into because drone laws are getting better. And honestly, a large part of that is thanks to DJI and their lobbyists. I know they really just wanna sell drones. It's not like they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart, but they, as a side effect of that, are opening up aerial photography to a lot of consumers. So you can fly in more places in the United States, but it's not unrestricted. Like every national park, you still can't fly your drone, and that's a real shame because that's the most beautiful places in our entire country, and we can't capture it from the air, at least not legally, and if you were to share the footage, that, well, you're putting your own evidence online for anybody to see. It seems like most state parks also don't allow drones, so that kind of depends on the state. That's why I'm standing here in this weird spot, because just a few feet from me is a state park. I can film it from the air, but I can't control my drone from the grounds of the state park. So I figured out some workarounds that let me get the shots I need. Okay, so drones are still going to annoy some people. They're still kind of loud. Some people think you're spying on them but you can fly them in more places. But why would you want to get a drone? What is the benefit of it? Drone stills, but especially drone video, really wows people. Chelsea and I landed a client recently who approached us because they were familiar, not with our still photography, but with our drone work. And that's weird because drones are only a small part of what we do, but that is what brought the client in. We then spent months capturing both stills and video of this massive epic park, capturing it at different parts of the season, different times of day, so we could compile this presentation to hopefully make the park look just amazing. We presented our work to a large committee of people. You know what people said after the meeting? Wow, your drone footage was amazing. That's right, almost all the comments were about the drone footage. You know how much time we put into the drone footage? About 15 minutes. Into the other stills, into the terrestrial video, we must have put, I don't know, 40, 50 hours. We visited so many times. We planned things out around different times of day. We walked around with our tripods and sliders, and it was, it was the drone footage. It was the easiest piece. And this Mavic 2 Zoom is the drone that I used. And you know how much this drone cost? How much does it cost? I actually don't know. Mavic 2 Zoom price. About $1,400. That's a lot of money. But you know how much our other cameras cost? It cost about $15,000. <laughs> so $1,400 versus $15,000. And this is the one that made all the footage that got all the love and all the attention. It is definitely the best value in my bag. Because I had a drone, I could fly out over the ocean and get perspectives that would literally be impossible without like renting a helicopter or something, which just wouldn't have been feasible within the budget. I was able to show the wide scope of the grounds, which is something we couldn't do otherwise. And as a YouTuber, as somebody who's making video, drones have been invaluable for showing how we move from one place to another in a car or walking and for establishing shots because you just cannot get those angles from the ground. Drones let you fly around mountains and up waterfalls. It's shocking. These angles aren't just useful for YouTubers, they're fantastic for landscape photographers. Imagine being able to think about your composition by moving yourself in three dimensions, by walking on water. That's what you can do with a drone. If you're a sports photographer, you can capture angles that you could never capture before. If you're a portrait photographer, you can get overhead shots. You can have people lay on the ground. You can show that happy, engaged couple from the air or over the water. The possibilities are endless. And not only that, but it's just fun. If you feel like you've learned as much as you can learn about regular camera terrestrial photography, to suddenly have to think in three dimensions opens up so many different possibilities. Imagine you want to capture the sunset, but you can't see it because you're surrounded by trees or hills. 
you can now fly up to 400 feet. And now as a photographer, you have to think about what your composition is going to be like at 400 feet. Could it be better if I put the drone up there? It's fun, it's just fun. And that's what really motivated me to circle back and let people know that now might be a much better time to buy a drone. Some of the problems I brought up in my initial video still stand, but a lot of things have improved in the last year and a half and drones can have this like incredible impact on your photography or your videography. It can improve your portfolio. It can improve your career. And for that reason, you really should consider getting a drone. If you have follow-up questions, write a comment down below. If you want to see our upcoming reviews where we review the latest drones from DJI and other companies, those will be coming out in the next week or two. So subscribe to see those and hit the bell so you'll get notified. And of course, if you actually want to buy a drone and you don't want to waste a lot of money, head to KEH and check out their used, guaranteed, warranted, checked over equipment. Whether it's a flying camera or just a regular old ground camera and lens, KEH has the biggest selection in the world of used equipment. And if you have a drone that is just collecting dust or you feel like upgrading, sell your old gear to KEH, it's a lot easier than taking the risk of selling it to an individual. You know what happens, somebody buys a used drone, they crash it into a tree, and then they blame you. KEH makes all that much simpler and safer. Thanks, KEH.